all seem to have the next market days after a fall. Long before we came to learn that business closes after fall. Each man each day telling his story that no one will take from him his glory. Yet, we all seem to have forgotten so soon. Those long years we sat under the moon, chewing fried bread food from the upper tree, scooping slices of basil on the table of three, and drinking the sweet wine of the raffia palm. Wine before came the white man with his offer, Manya vine. Yet, we all seem to have forgotten so soon the long years we sat under the moon before the coming of red nails, of swaying hips and high hills. Long before tiny waves land to stand on those hills like a saga, the stilt masquerade. When, if you held the man, DK, DK, he invited you in for palm wine, and if you called the wife, Oiridia, she sang your praises to a dance steps. Yet, we all seem to have forgotten so soon that this language we speak came from New World and Britain, same mouth that proclaimed the right to culture and
how we do. We have exhibitions. Uh, we host exhibitions from time to time. So we have, we currently have two exhibitions ongoing at um, Independence Layout, where our gallery is. So we have an exhibition on the Nigeria Biafra War, and we have another one on Odinana, Igbo spirituality and cosmology. So I would like to invite all of you to make our time to visit the center. And then we have Bukatumi Bay, which is one of our um, uh, most important events. Then we have a program for children as well, Nzukumaka. So those of you that have kids or you have younger ones, you could bring your children to the center for our monthly Nzukumaka um, because we are trying to raise children who are not just you know grounded in their history, but they know how to speak the language. They are proud of their Igbo identity. So that's what we're trying to do. We also have um, a monthly book club, both for adults and for children, amongst other programs. Now, I'm going to invite Mr. John Chukudi Utazi to come and give us just a very brief history of Mukatu Mibe, and then he will invite the speaker to come and deliver his lecture. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Chukudi Utazi, and I'm the staff of the Center for Memories. So, just like my colleague mentioned, Kata Uwebe is uh, an initiative of the Center for Memories. Uh, we come together every month to discuss topical issues that um, perturb us as a region, as a people, as a nation, uh, as an Igbo. Okay, so Katubi actually started in 2018, so we are in our fourth year. Um, the inaugural edition of Katubi actually happened on 4th May 2018, uh, where we have uh, where we had uh, Professor Chidi Odinkalu. You know, he spoke on Igwe Kunye lessons from post-war recovery in Southeast Nigeria. You know, we continued in 2018 in June, July, August, September, and just like that, and then in. Uh, November 2018, uh, the, we held, you know, the November 2018 edition. The uh, distinguished speaker then was um, Shioma Ivon Banefo, who spoke on Gidi Gidi Bu Okay, and then in 2019, we continued as usual. Uh, in December, in February 2019, sorry, we had Chineye uh, Mba Uzuku, who spoke on Onyekwe Chiekwe Igbos in a digital economy. And in March, we had um, the CEO of Afri Invest, Mr. Ike Chioke, um, speak on Mburonyeko, Reinventing Enterprise in April 2019, we had Dr. Joe Abba, and uh, the topic then was Ohamweze, Government Matters. Governance Matters, sorry. And then in July 2019, we had also a very distinguished guest, Mr. Frank Mweke Jr., uh, who spoke on Makoganiru, Igbo Renaissance, and the leadership question. Um, in 2020, um, Mikatu did not run its course, its full course, uh, because of obvious reasons. So in 2020, we had just three editions of Mikatu The first one was, was on uh, February 6, 2020, um, where Mr. Kingsley Ezra, the managing director of Tennessee, spoke of 2020. We had the former chairman of the Enugu Sports Club, Chief Ben Etiaba, uh, who is seated here. <laughs> Welcome, sir. <laughs> he spoke on Ijelo Bodozi, paradigm of servant leader. And in December 2020, after um, a couple of months, I think eight months or so, uh, when, we, when we could have another edition due to the COVID um, pandemic, we had Professor Osita Ubu who spoke on Organi Rubun Tuari development as attitude. In the whole of 2021, we could not have Nkatumibe, unfortunately, um, because we had a second wave of the COVID-19 um, pandemic, so we just took a break. But we came back bigger, we came back stronger, we came back better in 2022, and then uh, we resumed in February 2022 with Professor Cheluchi Onyemelukwe speaking on Afame Funa, reclaiming the Igbo idea. in a chaotic world. Okay, so in May, we had Professor Pat Utomi. Um, that was also a very interesting session. Professor Pat Unkatumi will be held in June 2022, where we had uh, Mrs. Victoria 
Ibezim Oheri, the Executive Director of Spaces for Change. Uh, she spoke on Igwebuike, unlocking our productive potential. Um, kind of introduction of Mr. Obi Asika. So um, personally, um, I didn't know much of Mr. Obi Asika until my, my boss, um, you know, many global events, 99, the CAF Nations Cup in 2000, Big Brother Niger, 2006, Dragons Den Nigeria, 2007, The Apprentice Africa, 2008, 2009 to 2012, Calabar Festival 2008, and Calabar Rocks TV Series 2008, Sakarex West Africa, and Social Media Week Lagos 2012 to present, just to name a few. Yes. Also, Mr. Obi Asika is the National Coordinator of the Technical Working Group for the Creative Industries, uh, you know, the tourism, culture, and hospitality sectors for the 2020 to 2030 media. Yeah, and long-term national development plan for, Ni for the Nigeria 2050 agenda. Um, he has worked with and also advised, you know, multilateral, multilaterals, corporations, you know, governments, brands, agencies on the creative industries, sports, strategic communications, public relations, and all. Uh, Mr. Obi Asika is, is a whole lot. In Nigeria, we have our own specific set of difficulties. And one of the things I was saying earlier today, but <laughs> so I just want to say thanks, man. But, you know, the thing about it is, when I think about the East, when I think about Enugu, and I think about what my t subject matter was, it's like a full circle of connection. Because from my perspective, when I think about innovation, when I think about soft power, which I talk about quite a lot, when I think about technology and its application, I'm not sure a lot of people really understand that Enugu to me is home of all of these things and has been home of these things long before they became trendy or popular. So I was like, if I'm going to talk about this in Enugu and we're in 042, I, sh I should maybe go back to come forward. And what do I mean by that? In Nigeria today, because everybody is in a silo, everybody is doing their own thing, and everybody apparently guessed that there is a different talent here. Even in this room as I'm talking right now, I know people in this room who are world class. Yes, they happen to be from Enugu, or maybe they're not from Enugu, but we are in Enugu, they happen to be Igbo, but they're world class. So I think the only thing that holds you back is your own idea of yourself. The only thing that restricts you is your world vision. My view is that Igbos are worldwide and we're world class and we occupy every inch of the earth and we see, right? We're very emotional people. Some people say it's aggressive. Some people say it's arrogant. I like to think it's emotion. We're very passionate and we're very, very committed when we do commit to a particular line of action, place or whatever. Now, for me, what I would love to see, I said, listen, I know you're not in office. A lot of it is to do with a lack of hope. A lot of it is to do with a lack of If we give our people skills and the tools to win, these things begin to go away. You can't, we can't be sitting here and pretending we're not seeing what's going on. Unfortunately, those of you who are in government, those of you who are going to get into government, every single state in the South bring our industries and our enterprise to technology. If you look at the markets in the East, which have been the drivers of our wealth for, I don't know, 30, 40 years, the fundamental belief I have is that, oh, you know Amazon is entering Nigeria next year. They're at risk from technology and at risk from the Apple in that ecosystem. That is what the world has sort of evolved to. And the way things are going now, if you look at the transactional value of what happens per second, you'll be speechless. I wish I had my slides to show you, but literally, I'm telling you that YouTube, on a daily basis, generates more content than the history of television since television started. That's just to give you an idea of what is happening. So that platform economy, Nollywood, Afrobeats, all of these people together easily have a billion followers, easily, on digital platforms worldwide. But you know what we don't have? We don't have product. 
We don't have goods. We don't have merchandise from the brands we've created. Where creates all these things and sells them? That place is called Abba. But the mission that is needed to be filled, Abba needs to get visible, accessible, and needs to be transparent. So that if Don Jazzy or Flavor or Amokachi or anybody wants to do a merchandise deal with Abba, he knows he's going to get his money, he knows he's not going to get cheated, he knows his brand is going to be protected. That's why IP is critical. When the age of IP, we need our state governments and our educated professionals to help to work in all our markets. It's affecting not just the creative industries. Anybody who does anything in cosmetics is affected by this, right? We have over 200 industries affected by this, and we control these markets. The idea that you're making money off somebody's work and you're not paying them is enough to kill everybody else that's trying to create. Abba could just have that platform and be transparent. In the next five years, Abba could be doing a billion dollars a year. Just on that. Just on that. There are enough Nollywood female stars to push product. But not one of them has a makeup line. Not one of them has a hairline. Why? Because we're not creating goods and merchandise to back the brand power we already built. And that's why I said that entertainment is known as show business, right? When we started pushing entertainment in Nigeria, the challenge was to validate the show. Because what used to happen is, unfortunately, people talk, you know, like I said, we like to be negative, we talk ourselves down. Uh, Ubi, why are you talking about these local boys? I beg, I beg, let's bring the Oyibo people. I'm like, yeah, that's... Why? 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 Should? So what you have happening is all our biggest stars now, they hardly even talk to local press, right? They hardly even do things locally. Why? Because we haven't built the platforms. You haven't built the ecosystem. But who controls logistics in Nigeria? I think it's the Igbo guys. The retail, I think it's the Igbo guys. But, so the gap is just the transparency and the connection to understand the opportunity that is still in Newi. This is up to 2018. I remember I was sitting, I was like, how, how is this possible? How are we sitting here and we're not able to show these places? So when you talk about, oh, Newi has this or has that, it doesn't mean conversation, the economic argument that backs what you're saying. That is what we need. And we have the people with the brains to make it happen. You know, I know people want me to talk about entertainment and the sexy stuff. But the truth of the matter is, the single most important thing is education, okay? Education is the thing we have to get right. Because in Nigeria, from all indications, all the data we're seeing, and the kind of graduates we're producing, the standards have fallen massively. The standards is the percentage of people that are not even going to school. Chika Mubi was sitting with me, and I said to Chika, before we got on stage, I said, Chika, let's set these people up. So what do you mean? I said, look, Chika. When the, how many local governments does Anambra have? It's a 21, right? It's a 21. If we take one building that belongs to the state government in every local government, that's a hub, right? So we have to, what does it cost us to equip those 21 buildings as a state government? It doesn't cost anything. It costs you maybe the money of hiring the hub manager and the team that will drive that. And if you put such a network down, trust me, Microsoft, Facebook, Google, everybody will feed into it because it's tangible. They can see it. This is 2017. The governor stood up, announced some committee, <laughs> named us all on some council. We never saw him again. Found it out. We said it, blah, blah, blah. Six months later, nothing had happened. I couldn't hold Chica onto Chica anymore. I.K. Chioke, who we planned the whole thing with, called the governor of Edo State who on hearing the idea, he hadn't even met Chika, I said, tell him to start coming. Chika landed in Benin. The governor didn't say, you know, thing, eh? the governor said, listen, live, work, play environment, and please come and operate it for me on a revenue share basis. That place is gonna open this year. And when it opens, but you can't bring things to people who don't want to engage. The gig economy means that they can work here, they can earn global money, but pay their tax here, and stay in Enugu. One of the biggest problems I always hear about is about people wanting to leave. How do you deal with retention? The way you retain people is to create value for them here. You have to build ecosystems here. 
not anywhere else. It has to be here. Because when it's here, then everybody wants to be here, right? So the first thing is the platform economy. The second thing is the gig economy. In terms of tourism and hospitality, we have incredible heritage sites and locations, right? But to get tourism and hospitality, you need security. So we need to sort out our security and we need to focus on destination marketing. What do I mean by that? How much money does the East spend marketing itself? I don't think we spend any money doing it. We don't spend any money on media. We're not visible, we're not present, okay? But meanwhile, we always complain, we don't have media, we don't have media, it's not true. I have brought, Frank is here, Frank was Minister of Information. We have media. Chris Ubossi, my partner, owns the largest radio group in the country, but there's no radio stations in the East. There has to be, there are reasons for these things, right? This is what has been happening, but everybody I know who's Igbo wants to engage the East and see what they can do to help to build it up, to get it back to what we feel it should be, because the truth of the matter is nobody's going to come and do it for us, right? Nobody is going to pull something and say, we're all champions. So let me just go back. The platform economy, the gig economy, the creative economy, we need to apply innovation to education. I already talked about that. And then innovation and technology. So if you had an innovation council for the east of Nigeria, which is across the five states, and I say the same thing for the creative economy. There's, there's, there's a group I belong to, a few people here from there, Society of Evil Professionals. And in 2017, just tell you how long ago, that's five years ago. <laughs> 2017, Emeka and Baz, I'm gonna embarrass him, but we put together a group of about 10, 12 people who have 20 years global experience, successful in media, publishing, Arts, Nollywood, television, film, digital. We put them all together. We brought all the reports we could find nationally and sub-regionally, and we created a roadmap for the creative economy for the Southeast. I said, I'm gonna share it to Center for Memory so they can share it publicly. Because keeping these documents and doing all this work, if the state governments aren't seeing it and they're not keying into it, then I think it's the public, it's the people that have to make the noise to say this is what we all need to be doing. This is not about Obi, it's not about me or any of the individuals, it's about everybody. Because trust me, if we don't engage, the world is moving, right? The world is moving, it's not waiting. In some places in the world, there's a recession right now. In some places, they're making three times the money they ever made because they were ready for the recession. Every recession is an opportunity. Even our present crisis today is an opportunity. What is, the, what is the position of the East? What are we going to do to take advantage of those opportunities? For me, as I said, the single most important thing, and I want to repeat it again, is the people. So the last innovation, technology, I talked about the Innovation Council, but what I really mean, I, mean, I thought about this thing, I said, look, the Naira has been devalued. If each state government in the East puts a billion Naira down, that's five billion Naira. I was at Eastern Innovation Council. I can think of 10 people that should be on that council yesterday. And from there, we say, okay, go and find one of the biggest global accelerators, white combinator, startup, and we add them to the 10 billion as the program manager. And we begin tech acceleration for the Southeast. I'm telling you that within five years, you will create five unicorns. A unicorn is $1 billion out of Enugu, out of Oka, out of Onicha, out of Newi, out of Aba. It's all here, it's with us, it's within us. But if we keep doing this game that we've been doing, we can't get there. Because we're not backing, we're in the age of ideas, we're in the age of IP. It's not about who has the biggest muscles, it's about who has, who has the best story, right? The world is not being dominated now America didn't win the Cold War based on its nuclear weapon. It won the Cold War because the Russians wanted McDonald's and Levi jeans. They wanted to live that life. The human spirit is very hard to cage it. So no matter what you tell people that they should stay in Enugu, if you don't give them the opportunity, they're gonna go. They're gonna go and you can't stop them. This conversation was happening in Enugu in 1984. I was here, I remember. 
Only a few stayed, but almost everybody left. Then they came back later as they got older. It was what they used to say then, it's a civil service town, it's not for young people. That can't be right. And it's got to be 24 seven, driven by innovation and technology with education at its base. That makes it a knowledge center, which means to me, and it was cosmopolitan, it is sophisticated, by far the most civilized part of our part of the country. No disrespect to my people, but it just, I have to give it up. I think Enugu always has been that. But to lead, you have to step up. And Enugu should be leading the East. Right now, I'm not sure that it is. And the thing for me, finally, I just want to look at my notes, because I had this long last presentation. I don't know how long I've been talking. You know, I was about Nigerian soft power, about the size of it and how it's growing. And when I talk about that, I want you to think about this. The state of California, the economy of the state of California is bigger than the economy of Africa. The money that black American women spend every year is more than Africa generates as GDP. What that means is, First of all, so that means respect black Americans, first of all. Stop talking down on them, stop thinking that we're somehow better than them. The reason why we excel in America is not because they are bad, it's because they created the opportunities for us to excel. We don't know that none of these schools were, they, didn't, they were not integrated by us. We didn't go through the 400 years of slavery. We didn't, any school you go to was segregated. Everywhere was segregated. It was color based. We don't even remember that we had white-only areas in Nigeria in the 1940s, in the 1950s. GRA was a code for whites only. That's what it is. But we don't have it in our consciousness, so we don't really understand it. But California is a bigger economy. And what is California driven by? Innovation at Silicon Valley, entertainment, Hollywood and then agriculture to a little bit. So, but to deliver soft power, you need to also have hard power. It means you need some infrastructure. You need some logistics. You need 24 seven electricity. You need access to markets. If you don't have these things, it's very hard. In the mentoring session earlier today, and I hear it all the time, Young creatives are always like, how, how can we, what happens, where do we, and I'm like, listen, it's the same thing in every place in the world. If you go to Los Angeles, everybody that serves you a drink is an actor waiting to be discovered. If you go to New York, anybody that gives you something is an artist trying to get signed. Since, 90, since 2000 and something, I get emails till tomorrow from Nigerians telling me, ah, boss, I go take you to the Grammys. Standard, that's who we are. But the issue about it is we need more people to embrace and engage our people. Because if California is over a trillion dollar economy just based on those two things, and these are things that are natural to us, innovation is at home in Enugu. Innovation in Africa was in Enugu. The first computers created by black people is in Enugu. Enugu has so many firsts, but who's told the stories? Where is it celebrated? If you don't celebrate greatness, what happens is you diminish yourself. And this is something that I find unacceptable because in reality, this place, I left Enugu in 1977 to go to school in England, but I was coming back every single holiday. My parents were like, no, Enugu, London. In fact, Lagos was a disaster. I didn't want to go to Lagos, so come back to Nigeria, if I have to spin one night in Lagos, it's like, you're crying. No, I want to get to Enugu. So even when I was in England, I was thinking, people used to think me, tell me that, oh, the way you talk, you know, that's confidence. Yeah, it's because you went to Eton. I said, no, it's Enugu. Eton is later, but England, I'd already been drilled here. My parents already put it in my head that we're incredible people. I saw it every day, Igbo people are crazily talented. But a lot of times, it's like we back away from the talent, right? We don't want to engage our full capacities. And when you don't engage your full capacities, 
it gets left by the side. So what anything I want to really leave you with is to think about that issue of how do you embrace the future. There's a couple of other things I was just going to talk about because if I don't talk about them, I had them on my list. I wanted to talk about tourism. You know, everybody in Nigeria knows that Igbos go home at Christmas, but they don't know why. And we've never bothered to tell them. That homecoming is a multi-billion dollar extravaganza waiting to happen. So if I create a homecoming brand across all five states of the Southeast, so the entire, I've run Calabar Carnival twice. The state shuts down the entire month and all civil servants, all they do is the carnival. People say, oh, why are they spending that money? Calabar was spending maybe a billion on the carnival, but let me tell you something. Every single hotel in Calabar was full the whole month. The people are coming in there is over half a million people and there's food, beverage, accommodation, we'll do destinations, events. It's not random. And when you look at the East and you think about the amount of people that come East, and it's like every year, it's like, it's like we're acting like we're surprised. What? No, everything. But you do need the government security, logistics, venue, government assets, right? If you give that to us about sports, the natural sporting ability in the Southeast is peerless. We are <laughs> Jamaica that has dominated the world of sprints and of track and field for the last 20 years. I would say 50% of Jamaicans are originally Igbo. All the sprinters from America, 50% of them are originally Igbo. Hey, by the way, don't follow my numbers. I claim everybody. So my Yoruba friends, good luck. <laughs> I'm just taking them as Igbo. There are people. The difference is facilities and support, right? I'm privileged to be on something called Sport Nigeria, which is a, it's an, it's something that an institution that Frank used to run, the NESG, created an SPV to try to unlock the potential of sports. The single most important thing we have within that thing is something called Spaces for Sports. Spaces for Sports is a community-focused plan to try to build 300 facilities a year for the next decade. But what are these facilities? Neighborhood facilities in your village, in the city center, places where if you are in any city in the world outside this country, you can't walk two miles and not go past a sports facility that is open to the public. Public playing fields, public facilities. That is where you build sports. And for me, I make sports compulsory in school because sports is what gives you values. That's how you learn to win or lose. Right now in Nigeria, nobody knows how to lose, so everybody just freaks out when they lose. But when you play sports, you learn that after you lost the game, you have to kind of shake the guy's hand. If you watch rugby, the guy just finished trying to kill you. That's what happened, he's trying to kill you. End of the game, he's gonna be like, oh, nice one. And like, man, you just almost took my head off. Uh, but after the game, he'll buy you a drink, and you might even become friends, right? That's what sports does. So sports, to me, is a critical development tool. And it's also one of the biggest businesses in the world that is being disrupted as we speak. Golf is being disrupted by the Saudi Arabians. Cricket is being disrupted. It was done by the Indians. The IPL as a model, the IPL is now one of the top 10 most valuable sports brands in the year. Even if you don't play cricket, you must have heard of it. Rugby is coming now. They're coming for rugby right now. And that's going to keep happening. That European league you heard about, the Super League in football, is going to happen. It may not happen this year or next year, but it's going to happen. All right? Some of us who are football fans, we're watching how is Barcelona spending all this money to buy people. They have no money. They keep talking about we're deploying economic leverage. What are they? They're forward selling their brand. That's what they're doing. They say, oh, my brand is worth $4 billion. If you want 3% of it, take this and give me some money. But to do that, I came to this town five years ago. Oh, thank you. I'm going to be excused soon. <laughs> so I came to this town four or five years ago to talk to see the governor about the opportunity I saw in rebranding Enugu 
into what I'm talking about. It was an interesting session, but they didn't really get it because I kept saying to them, you're sitting on the biggest brand that the Igbos have. It's called Enugu Rangers, and it's just sitting there. And you people are using this thing to sh give money. Well, I, said, I said, if you did this brand properly, this brand can generate 10 to $20 million a year just on merchandise. Easy. You can have easily have a million followers on Twitter, but you have to allow the professionals to do what they do and step out of this. But you know, politicians want to control these things for leverage, yeah? But the truth of the matter is that people can no longer really allow that to continue to happen. Because that is why you don't have anything. Because Enugu Rangers, when I was a kid, I used to sit there and tell these guys, uh, I'm in school in England, I said, they tell me about football. It took us so long to show up at the World Cup. I'd be boasting how the greatest footballers in the world are in Nigeria. Stupid white boys be telling me, who are they? Where are they? There was not a single one. We hadn't even shown up. We didn't show up. And this is the problem. They've given me a notice. I've got to shut up. So I am going to. But I do want to say one thing, you know, that when I think about this place and Enugu and the opportunity, what really hurts me is that it's all in your hands. Enugu doesn't need to go anywhere. The capacity is here. The knowledge is here. What is not happening is the right conversations. People need to park their egos and park the negative energy and focus on the opportunity. And what the opportunity is, is that everything you've seen before is actually nothing compared to what's about to happen. Because Web 3.0, the metaverse, all of these things are gonna change everything. And the beautiful thing about this period is that unlike when the internet started, Right? Today, we have coders and developers who are proficient today. We're not going to wait 10 years to catch up. We're ready now. There are people building solutions now, worldwide. They're building in Enugu now. Find them out, seek them out, partner with them, enable them. The future is fully yours, but to own it, you have to step into it. Thank you very much. applause was for me. Please, can we give our speaker a better round of applause, please? Thank you very much. So, um, very quickly, we are going to go into the conversation proper. So, there's so much to unpack from what um, Mr. Obiasika has shared with us today. And to help with that, I'm going to call up Mr. Nkemweke, who is going to be our moderator for the um, next session. Thank you, please. So, like we know, um, he's going to take some time um, to unpack the session, to unpack the ideas that Mr. Obi shared, and then we'll give time for audience participation and then for questions as well. Thank you very much, Obi. Um, it was very interesting uh, listening to you, and I'm sure, I don't think there's anybody here who um, heard you speak today that doesn't want to you know, keep on uh, getting some more insights. Very thoughtful broken. So as we go into uh, this main Inkata session, obviously uh, we want to do uh, more like a fireside chat where I'd ask you some questions, then um, you know, um, the audience as well, would also, you know, um, find out some things from you. So it's very interesting that you spoke about um, government institutions and um, academia, because um, uh, last week I was part of um, the speakers at the Lagos Startup Week, and we're talking about um, how institutions 
can basically bolster um, the startup ecosystem within, um, within Lagos. And one of the things I mentioned to them was that my view around the institutions is talking about government, is talking about large enterprises or corporates, and is also talking about um, academia. And the challenge is that we don't see these institutions work so much with the startup economy. But again, it's interesting, like you mentioned, that the Nigerian startup bill is now um, a good thing that Abel and the team did, and we need to work on that. I wanted to pick your brain around um, tying it back to the soft power, right? How do we, you know, if you look at the, the East, if you look at you know, Enugu, for example, can you tie maybe one or two um, categories that you can say, this is the soft power for this region, for this state, let's hone down on it and let's see what can happen, you know, three, five years from now. Yeah, thanks a lot. I, I mean, first of all, I think the first clear thing is around technology. I think Enugu has a strong tech community. They're active. They're very engaged nationally. And they're beginning to see investment, right? And you know, something that looks like a trickle today, by 2027, it could look like Enugu is the number one spot on the continent. Yeah. But to be that, whoever is driving Enugu has to be intentional. Yeah. It's not going to happen by accident. So the places that have done it, they put these things in place. For me, Enugu, if I, if I was president or governor, my first appointment would be a chief innovation officer, not commissioner of land. The innovation officer, because let me tell you the truth, everything is affected by technology. You know that better than me. Yep. So for governance, for private sector, whatever you're doing, yep. Tech can either help you do it quicker, can either help you scale it. So for me, I would say tech and Enugu is low-hanging fruit. There's co because you've got the academic community, you've got so many schools here. Yeah. But like I said, there are gaps. It's like people look down at the academics, they don't talk to them. Yeah. And that's because there's no R&D yeah. in the schools. Correct. Therefore, the schools are not earning income. If the schools were, had patents that were generating money for them, nobody would be looking down at them. Yeah. If the professor's making a million dollars a year sitting in Enugu, nobody's going to be yapping, right? They're going to be here. So, yeah, yeah, that's what I think. That's interesting. And again, you know, when you talk about Enugu and tech, it's interesting to find out as well that um, there's a startup organization within, you know, Enugu that basically, you know, puts Enugu on the map. Yep. basically because of, you know, how much they raise in, uh, in valuation, right? So I think it's also very interesting. No, that's a wonderful thing. Yeah. In my projection, and I showed you that slide, yeah. I had lists of, I had one slide, I could have made 10 slides of Igbo people who are leading here, nationally and globally in this space. Yeah. But how many of them know each other? How many of them are connected? Yeah. Are we using network effects? We're not applying network effects. Yeah to our capacity, and I think that's a massive, massive mistake. Yeah. And again, you know, you talked power, but you also mentioned hard power. Now, is there a possibility that, while I think both of them need to go hand in hand, can one probably go before the other if, you know, well, hard power, which talks to infrastructure and the rest, is not readily available, it's a bit more intensive, you know, can soft power go forward and, you know, probably at some point they, they meet. Is that ever a possibility? Not only is it a possibility, that's the journey of Afrobeats. Okay. Because I can tell you for free, when we started doing the music and you're sitting in Alaba or Idumota, the place you sit in where they get, take your CD, yeah, and it's Obaino or Tijo or yeah. Okoro, yeah. <laughs> it's not some sexy office. Right? Yeah. There's, there was, there's no roadmap. It has never happened that anybody could have this kind of global impact coming from where we're coming from. Yeah. So what happened is really technology and the platforms. Because if in, if in 2005 I want to take NATO C or one of my artists and put him out in America, 
on the East Coast. Radio promotion budget just for the three states on the East Coast is a million dollars in 2006. I don't want to ask the question of what it is in 2022. So nobody here can afford it. But when you look at the, the date, this is why data is critical. Today, when you look at the data on the heat map of the Nigerian top talents, and you look at the American talents, that's why promoters can put the dollar behind it. So you know what? I'm going to put Bernard Boy on my tour list. I saw him last week. He sold out 20,000 in Houston. You can do the math. Yeah. He grows $10 million one day. Yeah. He does eight days, do the rest. Mm -hmm. Eight times 10, $80 million, yeah. right? We know Nigerians, they just think it's profit. It's not profit. But definitely he's doing well. Yeah. And the big agenda is how do you get to touring in the first place? Yeah. It's not random. It's not from the Instagram page. Mm -hmm. It's institutions. That word you used? Correct. In every sector of the world, there are institutions, right? But just that they disguise themselves, they use different language. Yeah. And I, and I find it interesting when you also talked about um, the uh, uh, platform and gig economy. So I bumped into uh, this report, which I did some work with, um, and it m made mention that at the end of the physical year um, 2020, one, um, Africa had an influx of about $5.2 billion in venture capital funding, which basically came to startups across Africa. And Nigeria took about 67% of that money. Now, thinking about it, I wonder, you know, how much did the Southeast get out of it, really? 5%? And 5%? I don't know. Less. No, it might be less. Yeah. But then... How much support have the startups in the Southeast been given? Yeah, so the, the, the interesting thing again is um, we probably live in an age now where we have you know, uh, young people who have grown up being less dependent on people in government. Because you see, the VCs are supporting their businesses, right? Mm -hmm. So they move forward. And you know, um, the question now is how do we reach those young people? Well, I think reaching them is not the hard part, mm -hmm. right? Um, when you say young people, I'm, I, I think like those people. I have never waited for government for anything. Yeah. Because if you do, that's the death of the entrepreneur. Yeah. You can't wait for government. You have to go out and push your own agenda. Yeah. But I think that young people can always recognize what is authentic. So if you engage them in an authentic manner, right, yeah. they will come naturally to it. I think you're going to see that happen a lot. You know, there's a brand, Afia TV, that's coming. I don't know. I don't know why. I'm not even going to say because people are here. But I really feel that in the next year and a half, two years, because I know some of the programming and content ideas, mm -hmm. that's what we need to see happening. Correct. We need to have storytelling. Uh, there's a book called The Advancement of African Capital. I don't know if you know it. Yeah. It was written by an Oxford Don, 1984. I think. Mm -hmm. And that's the last book I've read that documents private and en sector enterprise in Nigeria. Yeah. It is in that book that I saw listed a thousand factories and industries in Newi in 1982. Yeah. What has been done in the 40 years since 1982 intentionally by the East to grow Newi? I'm not aware, yeah. and that's a disaster. You can't blame anybody for that. We are responsible for ourselves. We have to be, and if you can't push your best asset, nobody's going to push it for you. So, as a as a as a people as well, in talking to the last statement you made about the book you read and 40 years after, it, do you think that we don't hold our leaders accountable enough? We don't hold each other accountable. It's not just the leadership, right? So how do, I mean, you know, I ask these questions. Why, why would it take, why do we need external validation to do what we should be doing anyway? Mm. Why do we have to look at Lagos to know that we should have mapped the East? The East needs to be mapped for innovation. Correct. It needs to be mapped for heritage sites. It needs to be mapped for the creative economy. If you do those three things, that creates the blueprint for institutional capital 
is not like venture capital. Particularly, we see leadership, or do we have a way we should be seeing leadership? Well, I'm not. I'm not a big fan of personality cults, which seems to have been part of how we seem to think leadership should be. Yeah. My late father used to call it ABM. You know, acting big man. Too many people on that tip. I prefer a situation where the leader can lead by example and understands, my dad always used to say to me, that leadership is not a popularity contest, it's obligation and responsibility. And that obligation and responsibility is to the people you lead. So if you're able to deliver the things that make their lives easier and give them opportunity, then you're a great leader. Anything beyond that is vanity. So interestingly, talking about leadership as well, um, I, so I think we can open up for questions for anybody who has a question or an insight. But talking about leadership, it's great that I also noticed that you mentioned um, Frank's name probably about two, three times. Yeah. And you know, we also uh, know that he is um, one of the gubernatorial candidates. So maybe we can give him the uh, uh, microphone. Uh, can you have Mr. Frank have the microphone or oh, mine? Well, I wasn't sure why you wanted the mic handed to me. But uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Frank Mweke Jr. And I'm the gubernatorial candidate of the All Progressive Grand Alliance, ABGA. Thank you very much. Well, like uh, Obi, I think I've also had the privilege of 19 when I spoke about the Igbo, um, I think the leadership question, that is what I spoke about. And so it's good to see you. Thank you so much. Welcome to, My our, welcome to our city. Yes, eh? our city. Our city. <laughs> Thank you. But I mean, I didn't expect anything less and I'm happy that I didn't miss this session. I very much enjoyed listening to you. And uh, I was a little <laughs> uncomfortable as you kept going back to some of the things we did together in the past. Um, and I'm going to start from somewhere that might surprise you. Perhaps the first time that I invited you uh, with a group of others that you also nominated to attend what I call the Creative Industries Forum at the Nigerian Economic Summit, one of the sessions in Abuja. And the reason was very simple at the time. There was pushback from the board of the Nigerian Economic Summit group. Some people did not understand the place, the role, and the importance, and the power of the creative sector, especially the potential that it had to actually contribute to our national GDP. But when I spoke to Obi and a few other people, he got it, he grasped it, and we sort of ran with it. And today, the creative sector and the creative industry is a key component of the annual summits. And people have now begun to recognize the importance of this sector to national development, to branding, to national branding, uh, yes, to national branding, and then to the development of our economy. The potential that the creative sector has for job creation, the potential that the creative sector has for um, uh, uh, the growth of talents, and then even the potential that it holds for a nation or in this case, a state for really projecting you out there in the, around the world. So it's so good to have you. But I will just make another comment and then I will uh, hand your mic back to you. And that is the, question, the, the comment you made about leadership. Everything, ladies and gentlemen, rises and falls on leadership. Whether it is in your family, whether it is in a school, whether it is in Nkatu maybe, whether it is in a state or in the nation. And so that you can trace a lot of the difficulties we have today as a state or as a nation to the quality of leadership that we have had in our country today. And 
if you want to know whether what I'm saying is, not, is correct, is right or wrong, then you might want to begin to compare, okay, this leader was here, what happened? The other leader was there, what happened? And so in my city today, right, there's no way they could have gotten it because the exposure is not there. The worldview is not there. They can't get it. And so if you have a state that has produced the caliber of musicians, entertainers, world class, that Enugu has produced, there are few entertainers of notes that have not come out of Enugu. And these guys are there, and we don't know what to do with them. You take Nollywood. Where did it all start, Obi? Where was it born? Nollywood was born here in Enugu. Nollywood was born here. The world, the nation first heard about Nollywood in this Enugu. But what is the story today? They have literally, mostly migrated elsewhere. Because our political leadership do not understand the opportunity that they represent for a key component of my agenda, my manifesto, as governor. Because, as a matter of fact, a little incentive here and there, a little, uh, maybe one policy to back them up, a little law to guarantee certain things for them is all you need. These guys are already doing what they, are, they, they love doing anyway. So, I uh, thank you so much. And um, you can be sure that you're going to relocate once the elections are over. You need to come back here. <laughs> also see my brother, my colleague in government, Mekamba, who is here. The gentleman sitting right there, not many people know him. The gentleman sitting right there, not many people know him. Emeka, if you may just, please. Emeka was my colleague in government. A highly talented gentleman. So when Obi was talking about world-class personalities, yes, Igbo, an Nkanu man for that matter. Eh? An Enugu boy for that matter. A Nigerian citizen, but more importantly, a global citizen, highly sought after, highly, highly talented. And he was one of my key allies when I was minister. He was one of those that helped me to succeed. He was one of those that always pointed me in the right direction. He was one of them. He's from Enugu. But what have we done with him? Do governments even recognize that he exists? Do they even know what his name is? Do they even know what he's doing and whatever? And he's also the brain behind Afia TV. So these are people I have worked with. And so I hope that this would, you know, I just happen to be around. And then, you know, I'm attending this one. But these are the kinds of people that I either have, that I'm either friends with or allies with or colleagues with. But these are the kinds of people that I hang with. They've got the stuff. And these are the kinds of people that any leader who wants to do well, who knows what he's doing, these are the kinds of people you want to have around you. So, Ndiye Nugu, uh, keep hope alive. Thank you. Please. Yes, please. Do you have any, you know, what are you to, um, maybe a thought or two adding to what um, Obi has said? Well, um, thank you, Honorable Minister, for the very kind words. Um, I'm delighted to listen to uh, Obi Aseka. Um, I think when it comes to uh, industry, the creative industry in Nigeria, um, I can't think of a thought leader who not only can talk the talk, but also does the work. Um, and I want to thank Center for Memories and uh, Katum Mube for making it possible for inviting him to speak here. Well, for me, just to sort of re-echo this, two things I, I take from what Obi's presentation that I thought maybe uh, to highlight and maybe you can throw light on. Um, you know, you've talked about this storytelling um, that is important to build, um, that I think that we all certainly want to, um, want to come back. Because when I look at um, who we are as Igbo people, and um, there's, there's a certain resilience. And I, I, I say to my colleague at Afia that if there's anything we can do is to bring back this spirit of enterprise that we all, 
if you put an average Igbo man anywhere on this planet, um, two things would come to fall. He would defeat that element or, the ele or he would die trying. It's just no, no matter what. I don't know how that is the case, but that's who we are. Um, but how do you, f how, what's your story or what angle would you say um, in a literal sense connecting the soft power aspect, um, the role of the media, and whether you feel that um, there's a way we can hack these two things, you know, this, this storytelling. Is, is, there, is there an easy hack? Is there something that we can do as a people to, because I, mean, I know we've had this conversation, you know, many times before, but how do we bring this so that our people don't lose hope in ourselves, you know, because almost beginning to feel that young people feel that, oh, you know, um, I'm losing hope. You know, how do we bring back this energy, this spirit that we have, this spirit of endeavor and enterprise? How do we bring it back to our people? Uh, I just want to hear your thoughts about it. Thank you very much. Yo, um, yeah, thanks for the hard question. You know, like, <laughs> um, hacks. The funny thing is, there are, there, as you know, with storytelling, there are some basic hacks. And even if you look at how storytelling ha telling has evolved, right? You know, every story has three acts, beginning, the middle, the end. Um, and that is, if it's an album, if it's a book, if it's a poem, it's the same thing. If it's a folk tale, it's the same thing. Um, I always talk about, you know I talk about what's the difference between Thor and Shango, or Amadioha and Shango, and Thor. And people always say, ah, it's packaging, you know? They're the same thing. Uh, well. Shango and Amadioha broke somewhere in West Africa. Maybe Amadioha is around Enugu. Shango is somewhere around Ogun States. Broke and abandoned. Thor is heading to $100 billion. That's the reality. That's the difference. The difference is we have been afraid of ourselves. So we can't, if you can't engage yourself, how do you tell your story? We will all be alive, and somebody like Beyonce will go and make a film, and she will play Yemoja, and my Yoruba brothers and sisters will freak out. I said, appropriation. I said, you've been sitting here for a thousand years. You didn't tell the story. Beyonce got Disney to put out $16 million to do Black is King, got a Ghanaian co-executive director, four Nigerian producers, five... West African directors and fashion designers to basically deliver an African album, the biggest entertainment project Africans have ever seen budget-wise. Africans were freaking out. It's appropriation. I said, no, she's elevating you because we can't get the budget. If you and I sit with Disney, they're not going to give us the money. When Beyonce sits with Disney and says, hey, Enugu's hot, it's a wrap. So sometimes telling the story is about who are we telling the story to and where are we telling the story. I think there are certain stories that empower us inter in internally in terms of internal cohesion. And then there are the other stories that project our capacity. It is amazing to me, I mean, but this is not just about us. I just completed a documentary series that's showing on Showmax called Journey of the Beats which is the journey of Nigerian music. And you know, one of the things I realized when we're doing the project was that there's not one single biopic on any Nigerian. There's nothing on anybody. All these Igbo people that built all these trading empires, nothing. There was an idea you talked about earlier today, 100 by 100. Quick, quick. But it could even be two minutes for Instagram. You know, 
The stories today don't have to be the 60-minute documentary. You see what's happening on TikTok. TikTok, there are thought leaders on TikTok who before TikTok existed, they weren't making any money. Now they're getting booked for a million dollars a speech. I'm about to activate my TikTok account. It's like, <laughs> I'm trying to get into that space. But that is what it is. So I think the key thing about it is to tell uplifting stories. This is what America did for years with Hollywood, right? They made you want to be American. You saw Tom Cruise in Top Gun. Everybody wakes up in the morning, they want to go and sign up for the US Army. We've not been intentional about this. Not in Nollywood, not in the music. We've just been sort of cruising. Because as you know, we don't have programming. So the minute we get programming, I think that's, it's about editorial decisions at the end of the day. I hope I, hope I got close to an answer. Good evening, all. Um, I would like to ask a question that borders on the challenges that young people face um, with respect to with respect to um, breakthrough, particularly in industries that are not popular. Um, and I want to draw is um, I mean I want to draw some sort of um, similarities with what you guys went through when trying to grow the entertainment industry in the country. You, if you look back, as you said, there were that challenges, there wasn't that support from the government. And I am saying it at the moment because I, there's someone in this room who I see, I should call a pioneer. Um, but the thing is, you look around, what he does Instead of getting support, what you see is the, in, the government trying to kill what should promote that um, venture he's into. Um, actually, he takes young people for hiking, and in so doing, um, the tourism industry in the, in the state has been exposed. I've seen on social media where um, people who come from outside the country get to be, um, should I say, escorted around the state by the person. Now, what I want to ask here is this. What do you tell him? And how do he, uh, I mean, how is he going to get that major breakthrough that basically opens the industry? Because that's what happened to you guys. And also, for those in government, I think this is something that needs to be picked up. You go to or who exists, the, the landscape there is amazing, and we are not getting anything out of it. Um, I mean, you go just with, um, around the corner here, you see that it's basically a logging site. I don't think that's what it should be, uh, but that's what is happening. So could you help with that? Thank you. Yeah, um, it's funny. When I, when I was in Enugu in 2020 with the Center for Memories guys, and I had a session with them, um, and I, I had a session with a bunch of bloggers, in Enugu, and the first thing I told them was, well, I was trying to be nice. I was like, you're all failing. Why is nobody using a hashtag called my Enugu story? That's easy. Put my Enugu story on all your posts and build an aggregated community. That's how social media works. I was sitting with five or six of them, and if six of you post different stories, and it's all my Enugu story, in a month, you're going to be viral because you're going to find people coming to look for the hashtag, right? And the second thing was, this is when I was complaining because I couldn't find, this is 20, 2018, I couldn't find any shot by Drode. In 2018, there was none. I checked this stuff religiously. By 2020, all of them had existed. But till now, I can see that no state government in the East has invested to film itself. These are just YouTube guys, YouTubers going around with their own money, like your friend, exposing the environment and the community. The truth of the matter, the work he's doing is passion driven, right? People who are passion driven, he's gonna do that work whether he's paid, whether he's not paid. And that's the best thing about what he's doing. By the way, let me tell you, 
the entertainment industry, the music industry in Nigeria is not solved yet. Don't be fooled. Just because you're seeing the top 1% looking like they've blown, the journey is still just starting. Globally, our music is still less than 2% of the global music market. I'm a marketer. I push the agenda, but that's the facts of the matter. Our influence is much more than the 2%, but the volume is still quite small. Do you understand? Now, in Enugu, when you talk about what you are talking about, unfortunately, truth, sometimes... If you're a promoter and you're in the private sector, you will find sometimes that you do things that attract the attention of government, and then sometimes government almost becomes your competition. It happens in a number of sectors. It's not just the tourism thing. It happens with promotion, it happens with entertainment, it happens with business. You open a supermarket, the government guy opens one next to you because they think they have leverage and they want to dominate all the spaces. But the reality of it is very few governments can execute your idea. So government is not really your problem. What he needs to find are the brands who want to back experiences. Okay? Hiking and all these things are about experiences. I can tell you that last year during the pandemic, I have a friend. If you don't giddy traffic on Twitter, the founder of it is a lady. She's a travel person. I think she's been to like 90 countries. That's what she does. If she has five Kobo, she travels somewhere. Because of the pandemic, she couldn't leave Nigeria for like a year. She's not Igbo. I can't remember where she's from. So I said to her, look, you know what? Why don't you go to the east, man? She goes, really? Where? I gave her three locations. She came down here. She went to Avohim, the waterfalls. She went into the cave with the bats. I mean, she was going to places I'm never going to go in myself, but it's just to tell you that when she sent me the videos, I used to, I was sharing them to my friends. I said, look at this. Look at, people pay, you know, if you stand and walk on the road anywhere in Enugu, you'll see palm trees all over the place, yeah? You know that the world spends a trillion dollars a year chasing palm trees. This world, the travel industry, Everybody's trying to get to the, where the palm trees are. We live with the palm trees. Do you get what I'm saying? Even our domestic tourism can be 10 times bigger than it is, but it's all about what you see. If you don't see it, if you don't see that the, the hills are beautiful, that the caves are beautiful, that the lakes are stunning, and you don't want to experience it, it's very hard. But you have to educate your people to evolve to the place where they want to experience that. that that's what I think. Thanks, Ruby. Um, can we have more questions? And maybe we could probably take three questions together so that Obi can um, wrap it up. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Chibuzo. It's not, it's not actually a question, but like, I'm letting my thought out. I'm a graduate of chemical engineering, Oka. I can't hear you. Okay, okay. I'm a uh, graduate of chemical engineering, Oka. I came from Oka this morning. Uh, I grew up in Aba. I'm from Imo State. And I, I lived in Enugu here. Your conversation, your speech was more about investing in each other, collaboration. Like I, by the way, this shirt I'm wearing was it's made in Aba. I'm a creative executive. I have a team of artists. I manage them. We make records, make projects. But we find out that even when there's capital, that we find out we like we source to within ourselves. After creating these projects, they don't go anywhere because there's no like. That experience, not even funds to promote it, but like how to get this uh, content to people to like assimilate it. No, and there's no, I don't know how to express myself. You're finding it difficult to service, you're not able to service the broadcasters. Is that the problem? But, uh, to get the, the content out to. Yeah. To, to get to yes. radio, to television, yes. Yes. to the right blogs. It's, it's, it's a difficulty. And I came here and I noticed Affair TV, I've been seeing them on Twitter. It's, it's encouraging. It's encouraging to have you here speak about this. It's encouraging to come and share your experience. And lastly, I want to shoot my shot. I would love you to be my mentor. I would want to. I want, you to, what, 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 what you I want you to be my mentor. Like, I want to learn from you directly. Okay. I want to, like, because I, feel, I see myself as a, a, a loaded gun, but there's no one to shoot me. I'm just like, 
He says something about losing hope. I'm at that verge of like losing hope when you know what you want to do, you know how to do this, but um, uh, you know now you see as the country day. But <laughs> I would love to. I would like. I would love to. Don't worry. Don't worry. We'll talk. We'll talk after. Take it down. No problem. Um. <laughs> Okay, and um, good evening everyone. My name is Chim Gibiri. So you did mention in your presentation, you talked about IP. You said we're in the age of ideas and in the age of intellectual property. And um, I think that intangible assets are very important. But my question is how can we leverage as young people so that we are able to get economic benefits? For instance, you know that how I mean, I know that abroad, outside Nigeria, there are things like securitization of IP. You could um, go to banks for loans because they do value intellectual and intangible assets. But that's not the case in Nigeria. So we're in the age of IP. But what's happening to us? How do you actually leverage for economic benefit? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. My name is Nanangozi Chiku. I'm from Ogu. So, good evening, everyone, please. Um, I, I loved it when you said we should cut down our ego and collaborate. Okay, now, I stand to be corrected. There's this belief that the Westerners um, loves education more than we do here in the East. Now, my question is, what does, why does the Westerners understand and practice collaboration more than we do. Is it because, um, is, is it because the Easterners does not like to be educated or is there something we are not getting right? Because at some point when you bring up an idea and you need someone to share with or you need someone to collaborate with, especially here in the East, the way they will turn you down, it makes one feel broken. So I really want to get why it is like that here in the East. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Um, some great questions. Um, I wish I had like a magic wand that just make your issues disappear. But what I will tell you is that your issues are global issues, right? Don't feel like it's just in the East or it's in any one place. Everywhere I've ever been in the world, People pretty much have the same issues. In terms of finding support in your own support system, I was telling some of the people at Center for Memories earlier today, I think it's very, very important to surround yourself with positive energy. You know how you have friends that have negative energy? You have friends that have positive energy. When you're trying to develop something that's important to you, that you're passionate about, keep the negative energy away from what you're developing and be laser focused on that thing. And all you need at that time are real friends. You need a friend who's gonna tell you, my sister, this thing can't work. Or my sister, try it this way. But you don't need a friend to tell you, are you stupid? Do you understand? That's what you're talking about. People who are diminishing you based on your ideas are not worth sharing your ideas with. Because everything in this world is based on ideas. Everything we're using, phones, devices, the internet, is somebody's idea. The difference is, are you able to execute the idea to apply it, right? And that's applied knowledge. If you're talking about education, um, I'm, not, I'm, not, I don't know, I'm not really familiar with this thing that the West is more interested in education than the East. But maybe, I know we always used to talk about, especially young men in the East, you know, Imwai here, my boy, go to the market, look for money, right? And in a way, technology and innovation has disrupted education, okay? I said it at the beginning. If you're 15, 16, 17 today, the first choice for you may not be a three-year degree in the humanities. That might never get you a job. But if you got the digital skills as a graphic artist, you could work for every day for the rest of your life. So you have to be functional. Today is about skills. In the old days, they used to call it vocational training, but really digital skills 
coding, software development. These are things that make you almost unassailable. You know, if I could learn how to code today, I would. I have a friend who learns how to code, he's 53. He learned last year. It's totally changed his life. I'm just looking at the man. The man is earning dollars in Lagos. I'm very jealous, right? But it's the skills he has that the people are chasing. So that's what I would say to you. IP, it's so funny you talked about that. At the Bankers Committee a couple of years ago, we, in fact, even in the committee I chaired from, um, sorry, the committee I chaired in the National Development Plan on the creative industries, my number one recommendation was this single issue. I said, IP in Nigeria must be able to be collateral, okay? When banks say they can't make IP collateral, they're just being lazy. For 100 years, IP has been collateral in London, in Paris, in New York, in Los Angeles. The methodology, the financial techniques to do IP as collateral have long existed. So when a Nigerian banker is telling me Nollywood is not structured, I'm like, what in Nigeria is structured? What does that mean, Nollywood is not structured? It doesn't mean anything. Nowhere in the world, Tom Cruise does not own distribution, okay? In America, no talent built the pipes. They don't build the distribution. They're the talent. They ride on the distribution. Do you get? So everywhere else, institutions own the infrastructure. What Nigeria needs is to build its digital infrastructure for the future. We were talking about hard power. Part, a big part of the hard power is digital infrastructure. So I'm 100% with you. It's a recommendation in there at the National Economic Council and with the government. Whether this government or the next government, IP will become collateral because Nigeria must back Nigerian ideas. There's no point in any country if it doesn't back its own people. If you're not going to back your own people, who's going to back them? He's talking about the FDI that's coming into the tech sector from outside Nigeria. What's the Nigerian investment in our own tech? Where is it? If Nigeria puts down a billion dollars today, Y Combinator will partner yesterday. Straight. We won't even wait. If they even put down $10 million, they will partner. Do you understand? But we prefer the other model. So we have to invest in ourselves to get the value of ourselves. Yeah? So I've got to come back to you, right? Access. Access is the number one thing that everybody looks for in the entertainment industry. Whether it's music, Nollywood, there's a billion people walking around the world. If you go to certain cities in this world, if you, if you, if you go to Los Angeles, New York, almost everybody who's ever gonna serve you in a bar, restaurant, taxi, Uber, that's not their job. That's just what they're doing to get to rap, sing, dance, act. Do you understand? Because what they do is, they know they have to eat until they make it, right? So you fake it till you make it. So just keep hustling, keep pushing, keep pushing. But what I can tell you is, access has always been a difficulty. But I was talking to um, a friend of mine, Samuel Yemelukwe, who's one of the many Igbo guys who are involved in building these ecosystems, right? Whilst you're talking about education, you may not know but a cousin, of, he's actually a cousin of mine, but Alex Okosi, who's from Onitsha, is the person that brought Viacom and MTV to Africa. That is the specific action that actually changed everything. Okay? He's from here. After he spent 15 years doing that, you know the biggest platform where all African content sits is YouTube. Right? He's the CEO of YouTube for Europe, Middle East, and Africa. He's Igbo. Do you understand what I'm saying? Sam built Trace Niger to be the number one in Nigeria, ahead of Hip TV, ahead of MTV base in Nigeria. He's Igbo. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's how it is. I told you about Chris Ubosi with Beats FM, right? What I didn't tell you is 
the person who licensed all of these things is sitting here. Do you understand? Capacity, knowledge, activating the right people who can execute, right? Our people are getting it done every day, everywhere. But at home, we have a challenge, right? And the challenge is we don't seem to see each other. So you see what I said? You're baking the clothes, you're coming out of a bar. Man, my brother, set up buyabar.com. Just, do you understand what I'm saying? Build your own platform. And let me tell you something that will help you and anybody in the music industry. Sam created something with Hip TV and Sound City and Trace. And this is for music people. It's called Levels, yeah? So Levels is basically a promotional platform package. So artists, promoters, labels can engage Levels. Levels can do everything from video promotion, distribution, shoot the video, put it on TV. Because 90% of the problem now is how do you get on TV? How do you get on the right playlist, right? How, do you be, how, how, how are you visible? If you're sitting in Abba, you're sitting in Enugu, the people making the playlists, they don't know you, right? So things like levels are funnels that are going to help that process. So I think it's those sorts of things. And the truth of the matter is somebody can do it as a business out of Enugu. Because all the talent in the East needs to be aggregated and pushed somewhere. So that's a free, why don't you do it? Thank you very much, Obi. Um, so, well, yeah. <laughs> you know, we can, again, we don't have enough time. We're trying to keep it time. Let's take the right. final question, and um, we will wrap up for the day. Okay. Uh, good evening, all. My name is James Eze. Um, <clears throat> growing up, one of the earliest memories I have is uh, the expression Igbo made and Igbo sense. And um, to my mind, that was uh, a time when it was a thing of pride for an Igbo man to really stand out anywhere and say, Abu Moni Igbo. Unfortunately, uh, it appears that today, both of them have disappeared. Uh, we seem to be a people who are, you know, acting as if we are no more um, the children of our fathers. Why am I saying this? Uh, I'm saying this because I would want you to kindly, um, you know, tell me what new thinking we need in this environment to bring the success and the exploits of the Igbo back to Igbo land. You know, I, th I think that's something that is lacking. And I know that we cannot go on blaming the government every time. Uh, if we are really a very extraordinary people, how come we have not been able to think out our way, I think ourselves out of the, the developmental challenges that we have for a people that are as gifted as the Igbo people are? And, you know, in your presentation, you cited so many things, even in the last comment you made, you know, which has to do with, uh, with levels and, and the man who, uh, who was behind Hip TV and, uh, and Sound City and other stations, he happens to be an Igbo man. So why is it so difficult for us to bring these things home? Why is it difficult for us to make an example of Igbo land if we are such a great people? What are your thoughts on this, sir? Thank you. Um, I, I like all these easy questions. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean it's, a, it's a question I've asked myself a thousand times, you know, that if I spend my life telling all my friends how incredible Onicha is, and you drive into Onicha, all you see is dirt, and it's smelling, I, I, you know, what, 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 what does that make me look like, right? If, if I tell everybody that Enugu was the most sophisticated place in the world for black people, it, it, does it sound like I'm lying? Do you understand? But I know it's true because I was here, right? 
So memory is important. That's why I love what Center for Memories is doing. And it comes back to the storytelling, yeah? So a classic example is about, it's about celebration. But celebration without vanity. You know, vanity is easy. We're very good at it. We can Otinpu from morning to night, hail the guy, he's the chief. That's, yeah, we do that. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the fact that in every single inch of this world, there are Igbo people doing great things. Not just in Nigeria. And how do you flip that energy around for them to do great things in Igbo land? That, I think, is the primary concern of almost all Igbo people once you get to a certain age and you start to think about your life's journey and you're like, man, okay, I'm sitting here in Lagos, but why am I really in Lagos? It used to be because you needed to be near this or near that. But with technology, frankly, you can sit anywhere. Yeah. You don't need to sit in Lagos. I could go and sit in Onitsha. My daughter will kill me because she'll be like, ah, but how can I make Onitsha a place where she wants to go? Do you understand? If I knew the answer, I'd already be retired. <laughs> That's the simple truth. But I think the answer lies in the kind of work Afia TV is going to be doing. Because when true storytellers engage great stories, biopics, documentaries, specials, award shows, there are many ways, right? There are many, many ways. And we have endless stories, you know? There are endless stories. I'll tell you one story, just to finish, because I think it's the last one. It's about this question, I, you know, when my late father was in government in Enugu, 1974, they wanted to build an airport. Somebody, his friend, a friend of his, I don't want to say the name, was very, was pushing for Julius Berger to come and do the airport, 1974. My father told him that I don't award contracts, I'm not involved. It's a tender board. They can come and tender, but I don't, I've never awarded a contract. The guy was telling him, don't be silly. You know, take care of you. He said, he said guy, it's not possible. I don't award contracts. But let them come and tender, because I know they're an excellent company, and we want excellent people. But I have to tell you that we have a direct labor agency in our Ministry of Works. And our direct labor agency is so good that since 1971, one year after the war, they've been winning contracts in river states, in cross river states, in Midwest region, in Benin. Open tender bids. So if you're coming to tender, of course the man from Lagos is like, are you mad? I'm bringing Julius Berger, how can? Say, well, just come and tender. They tendered, they lost. The DLA built that airport. It hasn't changed much since 74. They built the airport. Two years later, when Anambra and Imo were split in 1976, the man who was head of the DLA retired because he was from Imo and he started his own business. And he became one of the biggest construction moguls in this country. His name is Emmanuel Ewayao. You have the capacity sitting right here, but you have to engage it. This is 2022. We don't need anybody except ourselves to win. That's it. Thanks, Obi. Um, I think we're running out of time, unfortunately. We need to leave here. Uh, I apologize to um, others who have questions who have not asked, but I, I think you can also catch Obi, you know, um, probably before he leaves and get some questions. We would like to keep the time, please. Um, so, Obi, I want to say thank you very much for uh, the fireside chat. I hope it was interesting for everybody. I also want to um, use this opportunity to invite uh, Dr. Ben to close out for us.
Thank you very much. In case you're wondering why I've been introduced as uh, Dr. Ben, knowing that I don't hold any doctorate degree, uh, let me tell you that I've been introduced uh, uh, as uh, Professor Ben before, Engineer Ben, Barrister Ben, so, <laughs> so that's not a surprise. I'm going to make a name on you. 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 And I want to uh, start with uh, a gentleman that spoke first. Uh, when it came to question time and comments, the real Nkata, when it was opened up, <clears throat> the former Honorable uh, Minister, uh, by his grace, uh, hopefully His Excellency to be, Frank Weke Jr. Can I call Frank Aka? I'll tell you that I uh, met Frank for the first time. He may not remember this. It was in London uh, when the uh, Obasanjo was president, and Obasanjo came uh, to the School of uh, Oriental and African Studies, University of London, to speak. And uh, Frank sat next to the president at the time, and I was seated behind you, second row. And that was the first time I saw Frank uh, live, and uh, I'm delighted uh, that you're doing what you're doing now, uh, that you've summoned the courage to run for governor of Enugu State, because I think you have the right worldview. We need uh, the right people to come out to contest. Any, any number, uh, by the way, I have a number of friends who are running for governor in Enugu State, and I'm sure it's not a surprise to anybody. Uh, but if we have the right people with the right worldview, whoever wins it will make Enugu State a great state. So Frank, good luck. And with time, uh, I will speak to the incumbent chairman so that he can come back to the club to address Enugu Sports Club uh, when the campaigns uh, open in September. And then you'll be at, in the main lounge, which is much bigger than this, because we'll be expecting a, a huge crowd for that. Dalo Mannem. Next to Frank is a, a gentleman who ran for governor in Alhambra last year. Indeed, both of us ran in uh, APC, All Progressives uh, Congress. Um, and what happened, happened in Alhambra then. Sir Azuka Okosa. <clears throat> Azuka is a senior member of the club. He's uh, uh, over 30 years ago, he was a local government chairman, in fact, my local government chairman, when Newi uh, North, when Newi local government was still together, since broken down into, I think, four, three or four local governments, but he ran. Uh, the, the local government as, a, as one unit, so Azuka. And he was commissioner, by the way, under Mbadi uh, in two different uh, ministries in 1999. Uh, that's him. And um, I want to acknowledge the presence and say thank you to a postgraduate lecturer from, the, uh, from Godfrey Okoye University. Uh, he's uh, uh, Ugu, Mr. Ugu Esquire. Okay, you are welcome. It, it is not for me, <clears throat> you heard from Kem Mweke, it's not for me to, to, to welcome him or to say thank you. This is his show. I mean, this, this is really a center for memories, if, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So, um, okay, let me say welcome too, but <laughs> we'll heard from you. I'll leave, I'll jump, Obi, and uh, appreciate my brother, Emekamba, who spoke and uh, uh, Frank referred to Emeka uh, when he spoke to Emeka actually Obi, I don't know if you realize that your trajectories actually uh, crossed each other. You were heading from Nigeria to England around 77. If I'm not 
mistaken. America was coming back from England uh, to Nigeria. In fact, you were heading from Enugu to, to, to England, and he was coming back from England to, to Enugu to join me at National Grammar School, Nike. Okay? So I'm really happy that you know, you've gone on to do great things in Nigeria. And uh, I want to appreciate you because when you were DG of Nigeria Broadcasting Corporation, I was leading uh, Innocent uh, a drive to uh, provide a digital platform to rival uh, Microsoft and whatever DSTV is doing today. And you were very helpful at the time. So I appreciate that. And uh, I know your capacity and, of course, what you're doing with Afia TV. I'm proud of you. Um, behind you is a man who shouldn't be seated there. He should have been sitting here, but uh, I didn't notice that. Uh, the immediate past executive chairman of Enugu Sports Club, who so... <laughs> <coughs> the Honorable Onyeka Onwe, who was my uh, vice when I was uh, uh, ch chairman here, and uh, who ran the club very, very well and left you know, his footprints on the sands of time and uh, was uh, a gracious host to Nkatu Muibe in his time as uh, chairman of Enugu Sports Club. Onyeka, really happy to see you. Thank you. Um, I will round up. I won't take so much time, but it's very important that I, I do these things. And um, having acknowledged the Mecca National Grammar School, Nike, our senior is here, Nduko Nduko Obuja Esquire, and, and the wife, <laughs> and the wife who's uh, a lawyer too, and uh, uh, Bujas, I think before Emeka leaves tonight, you have to punish him. Let him kneel down for a second. <laughs> he was a, a junior then. Now, uh, a chartered accountant I saw earlier, Emeka is here. I don't know if he's still around. He's a fellow of ICANN. He's my senior professional colleague. Yes, I always appreciate you. A man who, who is always here and uh, who will, will always support uh, the right projects. He supported me greatly uh, when I ran for governor. And after you know, sort of mentioning the big names, let me use a young lady who's always here, as we say as Christians, as a point of contact for all the young people here and all the young people who have been supporting Katu Mwebe. Uh, Ebere Okoye. Ebere, are you here? Can you stand up to be acknowledged? Take this acknowledgement on behalf of all the young people who have always been here. And now it is time to talk about Obi Asika. Obi. You and I spoke a few months ago uh, on the TEDx Asata platform, and you spoke about soft power on that occasion. When you started your speech, you did mention that uh, you're not a professor, and that you were humbled by the list of uh, professors, and uh, maybe one or two others, like myself, not a professor too, and Frank. But believe me, um, a number of our professors should come to you to take the right lectures on soft power, it's a very uh, uh, niche sector that is often ignored, yet very powerful, that we can leverage on to increase our GDP. You did so well. In fact, I didn't want it to end. I did not want it to end. And um, often, as a public speaker myself, you wonder your speech, how it's being received, how well you're doing. Without living here, I can tell you that you hit all the right notes uh, for, for, for us uh, here. Dalu, Dalu, Dalu. And uh, we hope very soon you come back to the club or other platforms. And, uh, and something you mentioned uh, in, when you were talking about the presentations you gave to various governors, and they didn't understand what you were talking about. No way would they have embraced it. You know, so we're not serious minded about leadership. And like Frank said, everything is about leadership. Everything is about leadership or you, until we get the right people in there. We'll continue to wallow in the dark and nothing will change. We have all the all that we need to explode. Yeah, we don't need to. And Frank, by the way, when I said I was going to get you back to the club, the last two governorship candidates of APGA, APGA that came to this club won. <laughs> in uh, 2017, I'll end, the, Obi, I'm, I'm not done with you yet. In 2017, when I was chairman, it was my first chair, uh, uh, term as chairman, I invited Willie Obiano to come. He came, had a good time, and he won a few days later. And uh, he came in November 2017. Saluda came here in October uh, 2021. A few days later, he won, too. Uh, maybe I didn't win because I did not address the club. 
but I didn't need to address the club, I thought, uh, I already known at the club. Obi, let me tell you why um, I think I'm actually very excited to be here. Not because of what you have said. I, I pretty much knew what to expect coming to listen to you. This is the biggest thank you I want to now give to you. But it's one that will go beyond the um, four corners of this wall. Your father, Ajir, became the administrator of East Central State. If I recall, it was in October 1967 at the heat of the crisis, the Biafran War. But that's not why I've just mentioned him. I mention him because when the war ended, he became the first president of Enugu Sports Club 1929 after the war. So I don't know, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not sure you're aware of this. Good. Your father, but not that, not that he became the first president after the war. Your father became the president of the club that midwifed the first indigenous chairman of Enugu Sports Club in Isaac Ene in 1971. He was the president that in inaugurated the first indigenous, because before Isaac Ene, it was known as the European Club. Uh, but the war saw the Europeans leaving and it became Enugu Sports Club and uh, we started leading the club. And from Isaac Ene in 1971, I was privileged in 2017 to becoming the 26th, 26th president, indigenous chairman of Enugu Sports Club. And seated behind you is the 27th chairman of Enugu Sports Club. So we, this club holds a, a lot of your father in high esteem. So if you didn't know that before, please know that now. And I did a, a, a sports club museum before handing over. Uh, there, I believe, I had the pictures of every president that I could find, and your father's picture was there. And uh, at some point, I will see what you guys have done in our nature for him. I made that request. And I have gone to Isaac Ennis' house, the first chairman, to meet the widow, and to see pictures of Isaac Ennis, what he did at Enugu Sports Club. So I had to be here tonight, and thank you so much for what you have done. I'll say on behalf of the Center for Memories on behalf of Patrick Okibo. Uh, Nkemi is here, Nan Naimude, and the rest of the gang, and the um, um, uh, rest of the, of, of the gang. Uh, thank you so much uh, for, for coming, and um, we hope the conversation continues. What is important is not what has happened within the four walls, corners of this, of the walls we're uh, in uh, this evening, but what all this camera would have made of it. It's being carried live on various social media platforms. And um, Ankata has a global audience. So you just don't worry that the audience here, it's, it's a global audience. We have quite a lot of people who are watching proceedings from the US, in the US and in, in, in the UK, all over the world. And uh, that's actually part of why we don't mind um, talking about um, giving the lecture in, in English so that our kids born abroad can, can follow. Uh, next month. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, everyone. We thank everyone for your patience. We've come to the end of today's Nkata Umwibe. So we'll quickly all uh, move to the front here, so we'll take a good photo with the speaker and then we can all disperse.